And now joining me in the studio is Jeffrey Landis. Jeffrey, welcome to Fast Forward. Thank you. It's good to be here. And I'm glad you had time to out of your schedule to come visit us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Now, you are both uh, an award-winning science fiction author and a working scientist. Mm -hmm. So which came first, the science or the science fiction? Well, actually, for me, they mostly sort of go together. I think science fiction is really the reason I'm interested in science. And for that matter, science is what I like about science fiction. It's, I think, what makes science fiction what it is. So it's not actually one or the other. It's both, uh, both together. When, when did you start writing? <laughs> I actually started writing science fiction when I was in graduate school. I was a graduate student in physics at Brown University. And uh, I had a little bit of free time taking courses and saying, well, I'll start writing some stories. It might be fun. Now, had you read a lot of science fiction before? I now, read or? so much science fiction. I always had my nose in a book <laughs> when I was a kid. I went through, I think, about a book a day. You know? All oh. the classic authors, Andre Norton, Larry Niven, uh, Clark Asimov, you name it, I was reading them. And, and what got you involved in science? How did that happen? Well, I've really sort of loved trying to figure out and understand how things work. And uh, again, science fiction has sort of been part of it. In fact, a lot of learning about science has been unlearning all these things that I learned from science fiction. And <laughs> this was so sure was true. Uh, but you know, really, science fiction got me interested in science. Mm -hmm. You are mostly known for shorter fiction, mm -hmm. right? You've had, what, one novel? I have one novel, uh, Mars Crossing, but right. then uh, dozens of, of short stories. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you've won all kinds of awards for them as well, including one in, in Brazil. Yes, yeah, I won a Reader's Award in Brazil. What is it that attracts you to the shorter fiction, the, the, the working in the shorter lens? Well, partly what attracts me is the amount of time that I have. I mean, I do have a, a real job working for NASA, and I just don't have that much time to sort of constant. It takes a lot of concentration to write a novel. You have to keep. Mm -hmm. But part of it is also that sort of I have this attention deficit. I like to work on a lot of different things. What I love about short stories is that you can write on it and work on it, and then then you get it finished so so quickly. Now, when you're working on a story, what, how, what kind of process do you go through as you're, you know, you, you get an idea because they're all over the place, but what do you have to do to get that idea into an actual story? Well, yeah, I have a lot of ideas for stories, and so few of them really end up turning into stories because an idea isn't enough. You can't really turn it into a story until you understand how it affects characters. So I'm at a loss with a story until I know the characters. I have some feeling that there's a, a character to whom this story is going to ha happen. That's the hard part for me. <laughs> I'm so much driven by ideas, and characters are, <laughs> are hard to come by. Um, look, you mentioned the fact that you work for NASA. Um, let's talk a little bit about that, because the work you do and some of the stuff you've done in your, in your non-writing career is fascinating, because you're working now on the with the Mars rover, is that right? I work on a lot of different things. I started out with solar energy. So I was designing solar cells and then looking at the applications of solar cells, both to space and Earth. And then I moved on to looking at solar energy on Mars uh, because at the time there was nobody else who was looking at the idea of can you use solar panels on the surface of Mars. And there's, there's some challenges to that. It's a very dusty planet, among other things. Then I moved from that on to the Pathfinder mission. Uh, I was working on the Pathfinder mission, and then I moved on to be one of the participating scientists on the Mars Exploration Rover mission, uh, did, Spirit and Opportunity. Did you actually get so. to drive the rover? <laughs> no, actually, they have a special team called the Rover Drivers. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> the Rover Drivers don't do the science part, and uh, the scientists don't drive the rover. <laughs> they, don't, they don't let you drive. But we do tell them where to go. Oh, okay. So we say, okay. well, we're going to go over here and look at this rock, <laughs> and then point the cameras this way. Now, so, yeah. what is it like to sit there? Because you must be looking at the live pictures coming back from the rover. Um, what's that like as, as, a, as a writer and a scientist? Well, especially at very early in the mission when we didn't know what we were going to see, it was just stunning. Uh, we'd be in front of our consoles and we'd have the 3D virtual reality and the pictures would come down and we were just absolutely amazed. We were just stunned at what we were seeing. And we were operating 24 hours and 40 minutes a day. Uh, it was a constant uh, constant operation. There was always somebody in the sequencing room. 
and we were running on, on Mars time. So we were, <laughs> we had an extra 40 minutes every day. You're sitting in a room, the giant, the science operation working area, with all the greatest scientists in Mars science surrounding you <laughs> and, you know, giving their comments and, and suggestions and saying, uh, oh, this is similar to rocks that I saw in Iceland and it has some features of Antarctic rocks. And it was just, you know, a learning experience to be yeah. surrounded by these, you know, wonderfully brilliant people. Now, how has your work as a scientist, because you're not only the Mars thing, but you've also driven the human-powered airplanes, is that correct? When I was in college, and shortly after I left college, uh, I spent most of my time in college working with the MIT uh, Model Rocket Society. That was what I was really studied. Uh, but several of the people at the Rocket Society decided uh, right about when I graduated, oh, let's build a human-powered airplane. So I, I joined the human-powered airplane, and we, uh, we built an airplane. It was called Chrysalis, and uh, designed it, built it, flew it, uh, and then went on and built another one for a, a prize. There was a called the Kramer Prize for human-powered airplanes. And uh, so we built a second airplane, the Monarch. And then the team went on to build yet a, another set of airplanes. But by that time, I was finishing off graduate school and off to... Uh, Working with NASA. That 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 is just that that, that must be pretty cool. Human powered plane. There's not many of them. Well, well I it. think fewer people have flown human powered airplanes than have gone into space. So, in, <laughs> in some sense, I'm a, a member of a very exclusive yeah. club. Yeah. As you've done all these things in science, you know, you're, you're, you're working at MIT and then flying in the model rocketry and, and the Mars work. Um, how does that tie back in? Does that how does that influence what you're writing? And has it changed? what you write about and how you're writing it. Well, everything is a brick, you know. That's the nice thing about being a writer is that whatever it is that goes on in your life is just something that you can sort of raid when you're looking for for things to write about. So certainly there's a lot of science that I just sort of drop in. Because I, to some extent, I'm, well, I'm fascinated by science and I'm always throwing in little tidbits of, of things that I'm fascinated about. Something else that you, you do in your writing that I find really interesting is, is you do the poetry. Mm -hmm. you, you've won a, pos a lot of awards for them. You've won the Riesling. Mm -hmm. What is it about poetry that, that drives you to write it? Because you know, you're a scientist. You don't usually think of science and poetry together. Well, the odd thing is another writer friend of mine, Joe Haldeman, started me out on writing poetry. And until I had met Joe, I'd occasionally write, because everybody writes a little bit of poetry every now and then, even if they don't always admit it. But it never occurred to me, oh, I should really sort of think about poetry and, and write it deliberately. And I, so I started writing poetry as something that would help me think about the ways that words work and how you can put together words to not merely do a job those are sort of working men words, but also to be beautiful in and of themselves, to sort of look at sentences as, as just a little work of art. And that's poetry, when, you're, when your actual words are in themselves beautiful. And then I discovered, well, it was something that I could do in little bits and pieces of time. So when I have an idea, no, maybe it's not something that I really want a story about, but I said, well, I can, I'll, I'll use this idea in a poem. I'll write a little poem. Oh, that's neat. That's neat. I've been having fun with poetry. I'm not sure if it's a serious thing that I'm a, <laughs> I'm a serious poet, but I'm a fun <laughs> poet. I have fun with it. Yeah. Now, do you, has the work you've done with poetry and working with the words, has that influenced how you write your short fiction? I expect that it has. Uh, that was, as I said, originally my idea is that learning to work with words would help me write science fiction that is more, uh, the language is more, more interesting and a little bit less prosaic. So I'm, I'm hoping that it's, <laughs> it's improved my, my writing too. And, and like I said, you won the Riesling Award, and you might want to talk a little bit about what the Riesling Award is, because I don't know if a lot of our viewers have even heard of it. It's one of the less <laughs> well-known awards, I suppose. It's named after the poet and Robert Heinlein's story, The Green Hills of Earth. Uh, and it's award that was made up by the Science Fiction Poetry Association. And they said, well, there's various awards for the best science fiction story of the year. Why don't we have an award for the best science fiction poem of the year? Mm -hmm. 
So it's, uh, it's the Poetry Award. Yeah, and, and one of the things in the short stories that I really like, they seem to be really about real science. You know what I mean? About what it's really like to be a scientist. Because you get some of the politics and things in there. Well, that's something that I've sort of noticed about science fiction is that despite calling it science fiction, most of it is not really very accurate about what <laughs> real scientists do in their <laughs> their day-to-day -day job. And I think that's partly because really a lot of what scientists do in the day-to-day -day job <laughs> is very uninteresting. It's very boring. Uh, I decided early that really what experimental physics consists of is a lot of time spent sitting in a darkened room while your apparatus takes data and you're sort of waiting for the, the spectrometer to finish uh, doing a spectral, a spectral run. There's a lot of, a lot of data collecting and, uh, and waiting in physics. So how did, how did, you, get, how did you actually get started as, as in the writing part? Because you were, you were a graduate student and you started writing stories, but how did you manage to get, get them published and to get yourself out there? Well, I think mostly I was just pretty lucky. Uh, I was writing sort of in my spare time in the evenings in graduate school because I thought it was fun and I was writing the sort of things that I read in the magazines. I was reading the magazines at the time, so I was writing that kind of story, uh, sort of the analog story. Uh, and so I, when I finished the, the first novella that I, I had been working on, I typed it up, sent it in to uh, Stan Schmidt at Analog, and, and he wrote back a, a, actually a very <laughs> a nice letter. It said, gosh, uh, I'm surprised I don't your na know your name because obviously you're a pro, <laughs> and I thought I knew all the pros. <laughs> but uh, So he accepted the story, and it was actually a cover story at Sierra, uh, yeah. December 84, quite a while back now. Wow, that's been, that's a while now. So what's, over those years, 84, so that's, and we're doing this in 2011, so that's like 30 years? Yeah, 30, yeah it's getting up to 30 years. 30 it's, years uh, or so. What's changed about the kinds of things you write or about how you write it, or how, what changes have you seen in the field with short stories? The field has changed quite a bit in that time, both in the types of stories, uh, and shortly after I sort of write, started writing, the, the cyberpunk revolution came in with sort of the young Turks of William Gibson and Bruce Sterling and Michael Swanwick saying, we're going to tear science fiction down and we're going to, to rewrite it uh, the way we like it, which is a, a sort of grittier, more noir, but also more high-tech mm -hmm. vision of the future. And that really changed the way people look at science fiction. It was very much the sort of the Blade Runner future instead of being the 2001 future. And then after that, the whole internet came up and it has changed and is continuing to change the way stories are published. Uh, even when I started, it was unusual that people would be writing on a computer. I wrote my first story on a computer actually, but it was an old an old-fashioned computer. It was the timeshare computer, oh, yeah. <laughs> where there's one great big computer and <laughs> hundreds of people come in and and share a little bit which, of time. Which kind on of it. a terminal were you using? It's, yeah, it's a well, VT100. VT100, of course. <laughs> so, what else? <laughs> <laughs> what else? And uh, so I actually, I suppose I was one of the early pioneers in in word process. Uh, so, but now, of course, uh, yeah. typewriters are beginning to be. Uh, a rarity. I re read where they closed the last typewriter yeah. factory closed. Or at least the last typewriter factory that's making uh, sort of English keyboard yeah. <laughs> typewriters <laughs> in India. Yeah. Where do you think, with short stories in particular, with shorter fiction, now you write short stories and, as well as some of the longer shorter fiction, mm -hmm. where do you think that is going? I mean, are, are you publishing more online now? Uh, or where do you think things are going well, I'm still, I'm becoming actually one of the old-fashioned remnants of people who mostly publishes in the magazines uh, and occasionally in the anthologies. But sure, I also publish things online. That looks like the way of the future. To some extent, it's merging because with the whole uh, print-on-demand type publishing, there's really not a difference. You have the text, and if you want to read it on your iPad, you read it on your iPad. If you want to read it in book form, you send it off to a print-on-demand, and you read it in book form. And it's really the same, the same text. You just get to choose how you like to, to read it. I'm an old-fashioned reader. I like to, 
to read a book. I like to sort of lie on my back on the couch and, and have the little paperback uh, in front of me. Yeah, there is something that's about fine. actually holding it and turning the pages. Yeah, isn't that's there? why I sort of hate George R. R. Martin because he's so heavy. That, you, <laughs> you can't know, read. You, you can't read. Muscular in order to you hold have to him work up like out. That. You have to work he needs, out. Uh, yeah. He needs lighter paper. For, yeah. So now, are you you are you are doing publishing online? You're doing. You're still in the magazines. I do a little bit of everything, but mostly my first choice on a story is to send it to the magazines. It's what I grew up with. I loved the science fiction magazines when I was in college. Yeah, that, and I assume that's what inspired you. That's what inspired me is all these uh, great stories and Analog and Asimov's and the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and all those great old uh, old pulp digests. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. To me, short fiction is what I started reading. We, like a lot of us, mm -hmm. it was Although the internet's the been good to short fiction. Yeah. Uh, because people like the idea of getting something short online that they can pop it up on their screen and read, uh, you know, read a story and finish it off while they're they're still in front of their computer or in front of their iPad or or whichever. Yeah. So there's been quite a renaissance of short fiction in the last uh, just the last couple of years as the new online magazines have been coming up. Well, well, Jeff, we're just about out of time. Okay. I want to thank you for joining us and keep writing those great short stories. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, when I find the time, I'll. I'll do another okay. story for you. Thank you very much. Okay, Appreciate you're welcome. It. And so, from all of us here at Fast Forward, this is Mike Zipser saying, take care.